Good morning. We're here to give an update on COVID-19 in Oregon. And I'm joined by Director Patrick Allen of the Oregon Health Authority, Dr. Dean Seidlinger, our state epidemiologist, Dr. Renee Edwards, Chief Medical Officer at Oregon Health and Science University, and Dr. Peter Graven, Lead Data Scientist at OHSU's Business Intelligence Unit. As you all know, this week we identified the first cases of the Omicron variant in Oregon. It was only a matter of time before Omicron arrived in our state. Unfortunately, it's here just as we seem to be reaching the tail end of the Delta surge. We are all still learning a lot about this new variant. However, we're seeing across the globe that it spreads very quickly. I will let Dr. Graven share more, but what is clear from the experiences of the UK and other countries is that we only have a few weeks to prepare before Omicron hits our communities and healthcare systems in full force. I've asked the teams at OHA and OHSU to share with you what we know about Omicron and what it means for Oregon. I know that bracing for a new variant as we head into our second pandemic holiday season is not what we had all hoped for. Exactly one year ago this week, we came together to celebrate the first COVID vaccinations in Oregon. We watched with excitement and frankly, a huge sigh of relief as healthcare workers from across our state received their first dose. Since then, 65.4% of Oregonians have stepped up and become fully vaccinated. That's nearly 5% above the national average. Eight in 10 Oregonians 65 years and older have received a vaccine series. And now our kiddos five and older are also eligible. Parents, we encourage you to get your kids vaccinated. If you have any questions, please ask your healthcare provider. Boosters are now widely available and every Oregonian 16 years and older is eligible depending upon when you received your vaccine. We've certainly come a long way. And yet, this virus continues to keep us on our toes. The modeling Dr. Graven will share today may be disheartening for everyone. I know we are all ready for COVID-19 to be over. So let me say this. If you take one thing away from today's press conference, let it be this. Get your booster shot. Boosters work and are incredibly effective at continuing your protection against this virus and hospitalization. And if you aren't yet vaccinated, now is the time. This truly can be a matter of life or death. If you have questions about the vaccines, reach out to your healthcare provider or visit getvaccinated.oregon.gov. As Omicron is spreading, more states are starting to follow Oregon's lead in reinstating mask requirements. Thank you to every Oregonian who continues to mask up. You are making a difference. Masks, vaccines, and the incredible efforts of our healthcare workers, public health partners, and National Guard members have seen us through the Delta surge. We will need to make the same statewide collaborative efforts to see us through Omicron. OHSU's modeling shows that we have about a three week window to prepare for this next surge. We are going to do everything we can to maximize that window. Director Allen will outline the important steps the state will be taking to make sure our most vulnerable Oregonians have access to booster shots and to make sure we are ready to support our hospital systems for another surge. A big part of that plan will depend on each and every one of you. The science and data are clear. Vaccinations are the strongest line of defense we have against COVID-19. And the preliminary research shows boosters provide a critical layer of protection against the Omicron variant. Today, I'm calling on 1 million Oregonians to step up and get their booster dose by the end of January. I've directed OHA to get the vaccine supply and distribution capacity in place to support this goal. However, we will only reach it if everyone does their part. 
I know that in some parts of the state, it's been a bit more difficult to get an appointment for a booster. We also know that for some communities, particularly our families with low incomes, access to a booster can be challenging. Please be patient as OHA works with our local partners in the next several days to ramp up access and capacity. I'll let Director Allen speak more about those efforts. Oregonians never cease to amaze me with the respect for one another during times of crisis. I know we will get through this next surge as we did the last one by working together. Before I turn it over to Dr. Graven, I want to thank our healthcare and other essential workers for all that they are doing to help Oregon. I know you are tired and frustrated. We could not get through this pandemic without you. Thank you for showing up every single day. And to our National Guard members, I had the privilege of visiting with some of you this week who are demobilizing from our Delta Surge Hospital mission. You always answer our call for help and Oregon is better off because of it. Thank you so much for your service. I also wanna thank your families as well as the many employers across the state from Intel to our small businesses for enabling you to serve. I know there are business owners who have stepped away from their own companies to serve on this mission, like Luke Leonard Concrete in West Lynn and Andrew Harding General Contracting out of Portland, to name a few. Thank you for your extraordinary efforts. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Graven. The floor is yours. Thank you, Governor Brown. Um, I'd hoped to be able to share better news today, uh, but today's forecast is going to anticipate another surge of severe illness in Oregon. Like many of you, I had seen that the infections had been increasing strongly in other places. And this week we learned that there are hospitalizations that are coming with it. While the severity is less, it is not low enough to prevent us from seeing hospitalizations. Data from the UK and Denmark that have similar immune profiles to Oregon indicates that Omicron is reducing immunity by roughly half. That means people who thought they were protected are no longer protected in the same way. Since the first cases were detected there three weeks ago, it is now doubling every two to three days in those countries and will soon be the dominant strain. Although the rate of severe illness does appear to be lower than with the previous variants, we see that unfortunately causing some severe illnesses in hospitalizations in the UK and Denmark. If we match that up to Oregon, where we see our first date of our first case and try to match theirs, we can expect a surge in Oregon hospitalizations by mid-January with infections that begin sooner than that. Combined with this heightened transmissibility, we expect Omicron will generate a large increase in the number of Oregonians who will become severely ill and likely need a hospital bed. It is different this time. The lengths of stay are lower. The need for ICU or vents, uh, uh, ventilators is less, but people will be needing the hospital and we are preparing for that surge. By the time we reach a, a peak, um, we do unfortunately expect that the number of hospitalized Oregonians could eclipse the number from Delta surge in September. Um, I'm going to show a few slides of how we've kind of arrived at these results so that you can see the pattern. Um, it is dramatic, and um, we, we will be updating this as more information becomes available. The first slide, you can see where this is available. You can go and get it um, from the website. Next slide. And this is, when you look through, you'll see an Omicron specific, specific update um, in addition to Delta, which is gonna really operate um, separately. So you're gonna see results for both. Today, we're gonna focus on the Omicron because that's all new information. This is new information. Uh, to you, it's new information to the governor's office as well. So we are all reacting this to this together. Next slide. The key parameters here that we're looking at is things that you've probably been hearing about. How much immune escape is there? That is, if I was previously infected or vaccinated, what is the likelihood that I could be infected again? 
So that is a parameter that we use to understand what's going to happen next. And the current estimate is about 50%. So about half the people who thought they had protection still have protection. Boosters are not part of that. They are, have much stronger protection. But of those who only have two doses or were previously infected, we think your, your protection has been cut in half for infection. The next parameter is, is how fast does this thing spread? It spreads incredibly fast. We know that it's changed. The mutations in it have allowed it to spread faster. And that is, is something we measured through r naught. Um, and that's the, the, even without immune escape, this virus would spread faster. The next parameter was the one that we didn't know until just this week, which is, are we seeing hospitalizations? Are we seeing hospitalizations in people in, in, in countries that have similar immune profiles? We are, and that's, that's the number that we're seeing there. It is lower. Um, the forecast you'll see shows that about 42% of Delta. So that's less, but it's not enough, it's not low enough to prevent um, people from showing up at the hospital. There are other factors that have been modified for the model, including, like I mentioned, the length of stay. Um, the, the infection is different. So it's not going to require the same length of stay, the same likelihood of, of requiring intensive care. Um, the number of days until you get hospitalized, everything might happen a little bit faster, um, including, um, and, and, and that therefore we're looking at a different, but because of how many more people are susceptible, it still can add up to a lot for our healthcare system. Next slide. I'm looking a lot at the information in Denmark and you're welcome to as well. Um, the information we're seeing is that indeed, People there, um, the vaccinated population is getting infected. Um, and it's important to see that because um, while we haven't seen the breakthrough rates here, they will, they will become much higher as, um, as Omicron is able to, to get through that, that level of protection. What we're also seeing there is that the hospitalization rate. While there's um, only been 63 people hospitalized with Omicron in Denmark so far, um, that that number is expected to increase um, quickly as their case numbers um, continue to double and the lag from when you get infected to be hospitalized um, uh, transpires. Next slide. When you combine those parameters for Oregon and think about when our first infection date was, and when you think about what our um, level of prevention is in Oregon right now, with the higher masking rate and other behaviors that people are taking, even when you combine those things, you still see a very large wave. This wave you can see goes above 3,000 hospitalized patients in Oregon um, across the state. The peak for Delta was 1,200. So just from that, you can realize what magnitude we're talking about. It's much higher than before. Um, this is, you know, the, these are the results you get when you apply those, those parameter estimates that have been matched up to other countries and states that are seeing this before us. We are seeing states as near as Washington who are seeing the doubling rate very fast. Um, so we know this is coming, coming close and we'll be here soon. Um, as the governor mentioned, there is some time uh, before we believe that it will hit the hospitalized uh, resources but we are staring at what will be very fast growth of infections and then the cases that will be measured. Next slide. Boosting, what is the impact of boosting? If we can get it right now, we're estimating about 7,000 boost, uh, boost, uh, boosted vaccinations a day. If we can double that to 14, you can see the peak comes down, right? So there is an impact from boosting and you'll be hearing more about opportunities to get boosted around the state. Of course, the higher risk populations are gonna be, have the biggest impact on getting boosted in, in order to um, decrease the chance of uh, needing a hospital bed. Next slide. The other part is behavior. And this of course is all the actions that everyone takes every day to avoid uh, COVID, and it's something that we're going to need to do again. As you can see here, um, similar behaviors that we've done over time, which we're not quite doing now, if we, if we re-engage in those activities, we can see that the, the peak goes down and it shifts outward, buying us more time for the peak. Uh, 
you'll hear about more opportunities, but most of you have known about these things in terms of masking and otherwise. Um, if we combine those two effects, if you want a little bit better um, uh, situation, let's say those things do happen. I'll show you in the next slide the combined effect. So here you can see the forecast with behavior response and increased boosting. And unfortunately, it is still dramatic and higher than Delta. This is a situation we're dealing with, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, many, many ways to, to, to handle it. Uh, but in the meantime, um, there are a few factors that aren't included in this that may allow us to um, uh, be able to deal with it better. One more slide. Indeed, targeting of boosters to high-risk populations, potential alternative settings for hospitalized patients, the um, are factors that haven't been included. We the impact of antivirals have not been included, and also, um, but on the on the other side is we are going to have some um, as as this affects people who have been vaccinated. That includes many people who work in the hospital, and so we may have capacity constraints that transpire from that. With that, I'm going to turn it over and allow uh, the, the next speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Graven. I'm going to turn it over to the Chief Medical Officer of OHSU, Dr. Renee Edwards. Dr. Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to join you today, Governor Brown. Um, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Renee Edwards, and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer of OHSU Health, which is also the Regional Coordinating Hospital for our state regions one and six. I'm sure that everyone hearing this news feels devastated and slightly overwhelmed to learn that we're facing another surge of people ill with COVID-19. Once again, many Oregonians will need a staffed hospital bed, which frankly remain in drastically short supply even now around the state. To be candid, this feels like another gut punch, particularly for healthcare workers who've been stretched truly beyond their limits. These extremely dedicated professionals are not easily phased, but after nearly two years on the front lines of this war, they're justifiably worn out and may well feel defeated in the face of another wave of patients sick with COVID-19. It's impossible to thank them enough for their sacrifice, and I thank the governor for acknowledging all the work that they have done. OHSU and other health systems in the Portland metro area continue to be completely full. Despite working together as a collaborative to leverage our capacities, we sometimes have to make the difficult decision even now to decline patients who need a higher level of care from our rural and community hospital partners around the state who are also bursting at the seams because we have nowhere to put them. The hospitals in our neighboring states face the same situation. And even if we do have an open bed, we may lack the healthcare teams required to staff it. This news of another surge is particularly disappointing because we're just starting to emerge from the Delta variant and beginning to turn our attention to the patients whose procedures and other medical care were postponed to accommodate patients extremely sick with COVID-19. Oregonians are already presenting with more acute illnesses as a result of delaying care during the pandemic. And we're facing a considerable backlog of necessary delayed surgeries. You likely have heard the Delta variant surge described as a surge of the unvaccinated. Although there is much we don't yet know about the Omicron variant, we do know, as Dr. Graven explained, that it can infect fully vaccinated individuals, especially those who have not yet received their booster shot. The good news is that fully vaccinated and especially boosted people are much less likely to develop severe disease. I'm sharing this information with you to emphasize a critically important point. It's not too late to protect yourself and those you care about from becoming gravely ill or even dying from COVID-19. Dr. Graven and other forecasters are showing us what is coming. And now we must double down on following the measures that we know will keep us as safe as possible. If you haven't already done so, please get vaccinated. It is the single most important thing you can do to protect yourself and those around you. 
and ensure that your eligible, excuse me, that your eligible children are vaccinated as soon as you possibly can. If your last vaccine was at least six months ago, you're eligible for a booster. Please get this shot right away. According to Dr. Graven's forecast, we have about two or three weeks before the surge begins, and it takes two weeks for the booster shot to become fully effective. So the time to act is now. We know that getting boosted, wearing a mask, physically distancing, avoiding large gatherings and using hand hygiene are still the very best ways to prevent severe illness and death from COVID-19. We simply cannot continue to see people die unnecessarily from this illness. I want to express my sincere thanks for your ongoing sacrifices. We understand that everyone is tired and pushed to their limits in many ways as a result of living and working through a pandemic. But at this point, we need for everyone to do their part. So we in healthcare can also do our part on your behalf, which is being present and able to deliver upon the services that everyone needs. Thank you again for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Dr. Graven. We really appreciate the strong partnership of OHSU. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to Director Patrick Allen. Director Allen. Thanks, Governor Brown. Again, I'm Patrick Allen, Director of the Oregon Health Authority. I wanna talk about what OHA is doing to protect people against the Omicron variant, expand booster vaccinations, and reinforce our already exhausted and overwhelmed healthcare workers to face the next big surge of COVID-19 hospitalizations. Today's news is deeply troubling and demoralizing. We're finally escaping Delta's grip. It's the holidays and many people have plans to see family and friends they've missed during the course of a two year pandemic. We all wanna put COVID-19 behind us once and for all. But today's forecast is a warning we can't ignore. Like a tsunami alert, the OHSU forecast is telling us that a big wave is coming and it threatens to be bigger than any wave we've seen before. We're tired of being swamped and battered by each new surge of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. But this isn't the moment to give up. We have time to save each other. I know there are many people who are skeptical about COVID-19 warnings and some who, even now, doubt whether the pandemic is a real threat. Here are some facts. Since the Delta surge began this summer, more than 2,457 Oregonians have lost their lives to a variant of the virus that's less contagious than Omicron. Those deaths occurred in a span of less than six months. Approximately nine in 10 of those lives could have been saved by vaccinations. I know there are many people who may hear that Omicron is more resistant to vaccines and assume there's no point to getting vaccinated. But here's what the science tells us. Early indications do show that Omicron is more resistant to vaccines, as you've heard. But even if a vaccine doesn't prevent an Omicron infection, people who are vaccinated are less likely to become severely ill. And the preliminary research tells us that a booster dose further builds antibodies to fight against the virus. I know there are many people who see another variant on the horizon and wonder, do any of the preventive measures we put in place actually make a difference? Here's the evidence that proves that your actions matter. Every single previous wave we've seen in Oregon began to recede when Oregon took measures to stop transmission from wearing masks to expanding vaccinations. Today, I want every Oregonian to know the weeks between today and early January are critical. We are not powerless. The actions we take in the next few weeks will determine how many Oregonians survive the Omicron, Omicron tide. State and local health officials moving quickly to blunt the coming surge before Omicron fully takes hold in Oregon and hospitalizations spike out of control. But we need your help. There are five immediate priorities in Oregon's Omicron response. First, Oregon will urge a million Oregonians to get boosters by the end of January. We don't know if Omicron is as virulent as Delta, but we know it's more contagious. More infections will lead to more hospitalizations unless enough people are protected by boosters. As of December 16th, more than 3 million Oregonians have received at least one shot of a COVID-19 vaccine, and more than 2.5 million, or 74%, have completed their initial two doses, ranking Oregon 12th in the nation. Approximately 28% of all Oregonians have received a booster or a third dose. 
In coming weeks, we believe our million booster goal is in line with the number of Oregonians who will be eligible to receive one due to the time that's passed since they completed their initial COVID-19 series. To reach our million booster goal, we're going to support our partners in the healthcare system and in local public health departments to at least double or triple their current weekly boost booster vaccinations for the next month. We're gonna add three new high capacity vaccination sites uh, to the six current ones that are operating or about to open and resume mobile vaccination clinics with support from FEMA and our contract with Jogan Health and local public health and community partners. We're gonna add and deploy contracted healthcare staff to vaccination clinics to expand appointments and clinic hours. The lack of staff to put shots in arms is our primary constraint that's led to scarce appointments in some Oregon communities. And we're going to expand our supply of mRNA vaccines. We've asked for and received a supplemental quantity of vaccine from the federal government, enough to administer 140,000 booster doses. <clears throat> They've also agreed to our request for increased doses on an ongoing basis because of high demand statewide. These additional doses will help Oregon meet current demand and keep up with the increase we need. Our goal to boost a million Oregonians by the end of January is urgent and attainable. We have enough doses. We will bolster staffing for our vaccinators. The only question is demand. We need every eligible Oregonian to come forward for a protective booster dose. Next, Oregon will focus boosters on people who are most vulnerable to becoming hospitalized if they catch the Omicron variant. Our most urgent priority is to protect older adults especially people in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities with booster shots, as well as people in communities of color that have experienced the greatest inequities in vaccination rates. As of December 16th, 51% of people aged 65 or older have received a booster or a third dose. In the coming weeks, we'll urgently move to protect the most vulnerable Oregonians by deploying mobile vaccination teams to skilled nursing facilities and other long-term care facilities in the next two weeks. We'll be working with long-term care facilities to implement their vaccination plans and provide staffing solutions. And we'll be providing incentives to get more residents and staff vaccinated. For under-vaccinated communities, we'll augment staffing at federally qualified health centers and other clinics to help them vaccinate approximately 800 to 1,000 people per day. And we'll work with community-based organizations and trusted community leaders to stand up 35 vaccination events for communities of color around the state with an additional 93 events scheduled in coming weeks. We know too many people of color were left behind in the initial vaccine rollout. These efforts will also support our continuing urgent priority to protect unvaccinated people of color with their initial doses. Our third priority is to rapidly deliver new COVID-19 treatments and expand needed testing. New and coming monoclonal therapies and antiviral drugs offer the promise of protection against hospitalization. For some drugs, they are effective within a narrow window of time after infection. OHA is working to develop a high throughput site for monoclonal antibody therapy in the Portland metro area. This site will be open seven days a week, 11 hours a day, and have the capacity to treat 350 people a week. Registering Oregon healthcare providers with, uh, will also be registering Oregon healthcare providers with federal agencies, so they'll be able to quickly receive newly approved antiviral drugs to treat COVID-19 and we'll connect patients to treatment and testing to maximize the effectiveness of these new drugs. Those steps by themselves aren't, aren't enough though. The fourth priority is to support healthcare workers and hospitals in the face of the coming Omicron surge. We're extending our staffing contract to bring more nurses and other healthcare staff from out of state into Oregon's already hard pressed hospitals and vaccination clinics. We'll use every lever at our disposal, including the Regional Hospital Collaborative, and an emergency management command center to coordinate the use of available beds, ventilators, and other needed resources. We'll continue to work with long-term care facilities to provide alternative step-down beds to move patients who can be safely discharged out of hospitals and free desperately needed beds. And before mid-January, we'll provide hospitals an interim crisis care tool they can use to equitably prioritize care if doctors and nurses are forced to make heartbreaking decisions in the face of limited intensive care beds ventilators, and other resources. Finally, we're gonna work to change our messaging a bit and connect more people to boosters, treatments, and testing. I know there are many people today who want a booster and are frustrated that they have to wait a week or more for a nearby appointment. As I said earlier, 
These local shortages are not due to a lack of vaccines. They're due to a lack of staffing and a healthcare system still reeling from Delta's punch. As we expand high capacity vaccination sites, deploy more mobile clinics and reinforce FQHCs with more vaccinators, we want Oregonians who are eligible for a booster to know where they can find one. In coming days, we're shifting our outreach focus to connecting people to boosters. You'll see more outreach messages focused on boosters from billboards to spots on social media. For example, next week, we'll begin running ads on social media aimed at informing Spanish-speaking older adults that they're eligible for boosters and letting them know where they can get a shot. But the steps health officials take won't stop Omicron alone. Ultimately, the number of lives we save comes to the choices each one of us make. As Dr. Graven's model shows, our own actions can blunt Omicron surge and keep thousands of Oregonians from get, uh, going into the hospital over the coming months. The overwhelming majority of Oregonians have exercised their personal responsibility and demonstrated their concern for their family and neighbors throughout the pandemic. More than eight in 10 Oregon adults are vaccinated. Research shows that Oregonians wear masks in public more than Americans do in most other states. Taking care of each other has been what Oregon has always been about. It's those values we need to call on again. We can reach our goal to protect a million Oregonians by the end of January. Get your booster as soon as you're eligible, no matter your age. Wear a mask when you're indoors in public and keep your indoor gatherings small. To find out where you can get a booster, go to www.getvaccinated.oregon, excuse me, getvaccinatedoregon.gov. Now I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Director Allen. We are incredibly grateful for the dedication and determination of your team at OHA in keeping Oregonians safe and healthy. Uh, with that, Charles, uh, we are ready for questions. Thank you, Governor. Um, for the reporters on the line, just a quick reminder, we'll be using the raise your hand function to ask a question. Uh, we'll start first with Gary Warner from EO Media. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, wanted to ask, uh, since this began about two years ago here, uh, we've had um, a number of variants come through especially Delta and Omicron. We've had uh, variants of, of uh, interest, uh, which are the lowest level, variants of concern like Omicron and Delta. There's this third category of variants of high consequence that we haven't had. And I was wondering if Dr. Graven or somebody else could tell us about that and how likely that that sort of uh, variant uh, might come to the state. Thank you, Gary, for your question. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Graven and uh, uh, the folks at OHSU. Yeah, you know, the answer to your question is, you know, indeed, um, th those are going to have bigger impacts. Um, you know, I, I think that is that is a forward looking thought. And I think that there's probably going to be good pressure to indicate um, a variant like this in, in that space, because we, we know that this one is going to uh, create the, the kind of um, consequences that um, that, that that sort of um, designation is designed for. But beyond that, I'm not tracking that as closely. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll pause with that and, and see um, if there's anybody else who has an answer. Dr. Seidlinger, do you want to tackle that one? Thank you, Governor Brown, and thank you, Dr. Craven. Um, the, the CDC and the World Health Organization categorized new variants into how they're going to impact community. So certainly right now, um, the variant of concern um, that's in front of us is Delta, and the variant of concern that is arriving um, is Omicron. If this has even greater impacts than are forecasted and starts to have um, the impacts on healthcare systems in countries and um, other states, the CDC, the World Health Organization, will reevaluate their categorization of this variant. Again, what we know now is that it spreads extremely quickly. It may cause less severe disease, and our vaccines remain effective at preventing severe disease and um, infection, even though their efficacy or how well they work has gone down. So the steps remain in people's hands to mitigate and blunt this impact. Get vaccinated if you're not already vaccinated. Get boosted if it's the time is right, um, and wear a mask when you're in public places. And that will help us all avoid um, the calamity that we would see um, this if this should spread even quicker and have even more of an impact. If I could follow on just real, real quick, what are the factors that would bring a variant of high consequence to Oregon? 
would it be that uh, there's still a large number of people who are unvaccinated and are kind of like personal petri dishes uh, for uh, new variants? Um, how can we tap down uh, the possibility of uh, this kind of higher consequence uh, variant? So the risk for the development of higher consequence variants is transmission. Um, the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, mutates as do many other viruses. And as that virus mutates, has changes um, in its structure, it can impact the way it behaves. It can make it more transmissible, cause more severe disease, or elude vaccinations and treatment. So the more this virus transmits, whether that's here in Oregon, in other states across the United States, or in other countries, the more chance we'll get a mutation that becomes that much more difficult um, to combat with our existing tools. We're seeing a lot of those frightening characteristics in Omicron. Omicron has just arrived here, but what we see with the spread in other countries and in other states is that it is very quick. And even with less severe disease, it can have severe impacts on our healthcare system because more people are getting sick. We have vaccinations that offer protection, even though they're diminished, but we can increase that protection by getting people boosted, particularly those who are most vulnerable. So anything we can do to stop transmission will stop um, the formation of these variants, but it is a true team effort. It's not just you as an individual, it's your neighbors in Oregon, um, strangers across the state that are gonna help prevent the spread here in Oregon. It's our neighboring states and other states where people make the choice to get vaccinated and prevent the spread that are gonna prevent these variants from emerging in other states. And it's getting vaccines and other protective measures across the world that are gonna prevent this transmission. That's what we all need to do. Thank you, Gary, for the question. We'll go next to Amelia Templeton with, uh, excuse me, with OPB. Go ahead, Amelia. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is for Peter Graven. Um, Peter, you know, like a lot of people, I've, I've followed your forecasts closely. I know you have a pretty good track record at predicting things here in Oregon, but there's a lot of new uncertainty to account for. Um, and I'm just wondering, given how astonishing these projections are, have you done any sort of peer review? Have you checked this against, is anyone else doing a state level forecast that you can hold this up against and compare it to? Dr. Graven, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, the reality is the uncertainty on this forecast is higher than usual. So if folks who have been following my Delta forecast, those have been very tightly close um, to, to what we've seen in actual. Um, this one is, there, there is more speculation here, right? So we're, we're, we are trying to anticipate parameters that are not fully known yet and then extrapolate up for Oregon. Um, I would say the peak size is the one that I'm most uncertain of. The speed at which it gets here, I'm, I'm less, um, I, I have more confidence in that. So, um, you know, we're, we're sharing information here. Indeed, um, that peak could come down. Um, I would like to see it to get below the Delta level. Uh, but right now, when we look at parameters that we are seeing, and these are the same kind of parameters that are being advised for CDC modeling and other places um, to, to, um, to try to predict it. Now, I will say there are not other forecasters who are doing much of predicting Omicron in, in Oregon. In fact, around the country, you, you, will, be, you will not find hardly any, any forecasts yet. So um, this is early and they probably will change. And so to that point, um, the key here is, is, is that the timing is, in any case, we have this, this period of time beforehand, and, um, and this is why the action is so important. I wanted to get these out as soon as I could, as soon as I knew that we really were dealing with this. Um, and, and yes, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the same boat as everybody else, hoping that we see a lower peak than this. Uh, but right now, this is the numbers we have, and we know we need to take action. Thank you, Amelia. Um, our next question is a written question, Governor, from Rachel Monahan at Willamette Week. Uh, Rachel asks, uh, Governor, are you committing to keeping schools open? Absolutely. We know that our children learn best when they are in the classrooms with their educators, their teachers, and their peers. And so I am absolutely committed to keeping our schools open to the extent that we can do that safely. 
Um, now that uh, five-year-olds and older uh, kiddos can get boosted, um, this is an incredibly valuable tool. And obviously we will continue to mask and we will continue to move forward on our path regarding uh, tests to stay uh, in the school system. Uh, obviously schools for right now are on a two week break. So we hope uh, students and educators enjoy uh, the break, but stay safe uh, while they're on holiday. Uh, Dr. Seidlinger. Thank you, Governor Brown. I think um, to reemphasize a few points, with the protective measures we have in place, schools can be one of the safest locations um, for um, children um, during this surge. We have vaccine mandates in place for teachers and staff, and they've stepped up and gotten their vaccination. That protects themselves, the families they return home to, and the broader school community. Um, almost all students now are eligible for vaccines. And we've seen incredible uptake, not just in our older adolescents, but in the youngest students. So thank you to those parents and those children who've gotten their vaccine. You're protecting yourself, your friends and your families, and that's going a long way. In addition, we've taken steps with our Oregon Department of Education colleagues and our local school and public health um, colleagues to increase ventilation, um, to um, require masks in schools, to take other measures that keep kids apart as much as possible um, when it's safe to do so. These measures taken together make school probably the least likely place where students, where children will get infected. It's more in the community, in the social settings, some extracurricular activities where the risk is higher. So um, I ask that as students and teachers and staff enjoy their winter break, that they do so safely, they take steps to protect themselves and the school community that they're gonna return um, to in January um, because keeping them in desk in front of talented teachers is a priority for all of us, but we wanna do so in the safest way possible and the tools we have right now are allowing that to happen. Thank you for the question, Rachel. Our next question is from Lynn Terry with the Oregon Capital Chronicle. Go ahead, Lynn. Lynn, are you there? You're muting me. Sorry, go. It's telling. Go ahead now. <laughs> okay, I have two questions. Uh, one for Governor Brown, the other for Dr. Seidlinger or Peter Graven. I'll start with that one first. Um, I'm just wondering, what do we actually know about how effective the boosters are against Omicron? Omicron. <laughs> That's my first question, and then I have one for Governor Brown. Thank you, Lynn. This is um, Dean Seidlinger. Um, what we know about vaccinations um, against Omicron is still evolving. There seems to be decreased effectiveness against preventing all diseases, and that's probably leading to the fast spread we're seeing um, in other communities. Um, there is still some protection from getting vaccinated. So whether it's the first dose of your vaccine series or the second, that is offering you some protection. There is also a decrease in protection against severe disease or, or the disease that would cause you to be hospitalized. But again, it still offers um, good protection. In some early data at looking at mRNA vaccines, what was seen is while that um, protection against being hospitalized decreased in people who were boosted, and this was relatively recent after their boost dose because of the timing, they had almost the same protection against Omicron as they get, did against Delta with a primary series. So while we do see less effectiveness with these vaccines, we know that being fully vaccinated and boosted offers tremendous protection against being hospitalized and can even cut down on you being sick. And that's why we're all in this together. Get your vaccine, first dose, second dose, or booster dose as soon as you're eligible, and you'll do a great job towards protecting yourself, your loved ones, and your fellow Oregonians. Thanks, Dean. Go, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just one quick question. I wonder if there's, with this, you know, big surge in our future, um, worse than Delta, um, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, thoughts of increasing any of the um, restrictions for, um, you know, against the virus. Safety protocol. So our, our focus right now over the next couple of weeks is to get our most vulnerable 
Oregonians boosted, and that will be where uh, OHA and teams and partners will be spending their time and energy. Uh, we are literally uh, on a race against the clock, and so we're really focused on uh, boosting uh, these vulnerable Oregonians that are in assisted living, and that are in congregate care, that are in adult foster homes. So that will be the focus. I, I have to say, um, the numbers that we've just seen, uh, along with all Oregonians, are incredibly concerning. And I will just say that all options are on the table, but my focus right now is uh, addressing the needs of these most vulnerable Oregonians. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. We'll go next to uh, Ted Sickinger with Oregonian. Go ahead, Ted. Hi, yeah, um, I guess my question is two part, one for um, Dr. Graven and uh, maybe the governor, um, you, you sort of answered this question, but um, it looks like the forecast, even with the interventions that um, we're talking about today is going to still exceed 2000 hospitalizations. And I guess um, there's another page in your forecast that talks about, you know, kind of keeping it at the level of the Delta surge, but that doesn't look like what your forecast is predicting. Is that correct? And I guess, you know, just adding to, to Lynn's question, in previous surges, Governor, we, you know, you have, uh, you know, undertaken, you know, many other in, uh, interventions. Uh, if the healthcare system is going to be swamped, why wouldn't we step in with some kind of freeze or some additional, you know, vaccine mandates in particular settings or reinstating the outdoor um, masking mandate, et cetera? Thank you. Dr. Graven, do you want to answer the first part of the question? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, yeah, the, the, the reality is um, uh, you, you are noting correctly that the, the forecast is, is, you know, even with some behavior and some boosting, we're seeing around 2000. Um, there was a, a previous version actually that showed more delta levels um, and, and that's been revised upwards. The, 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 the main point is, and you know, I kind of mentioned this before is, that, that peak number will move around. So, um, I, I, but the timing is the key part here. And so seeing, you know, seeing that, you know, basically every scenario we throw at it, it's still producing a large surge. That, that's the issue and why, even with a little uncertainty, I, you know, it's important that we're, we're taking those, those um, response, uh, those, those actions. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's, does that answer it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And, and Ted, I'll just be upfront with Oregonians. Um, this information is coming at us very quickly. I am meeting, for example, with a number of our partners in the business community and the labor community to talk with them about efforts that we all can take to help uh, reduce, uh, uh, flatten the curve and to get uh, more Oregonians boosted in a very short period of time. But we are certainly taking action, and I think Director Allen uh, laid out uh, the action steps that the Oregon Health Authority is taking. And we are also taking action at the state level. For example, uh, state employees uh, that have been working remotely were expected to be back in the office after the first of the year. Uh, we are going to delay that. Obviously, state services will continue to be provided, uh, but we will uh, delay having folks come back into the workforce for those who haven't come back in yet. So those are the types of conversations that we will have over the next couple of days. Um, but honestly, these are the same tools um, that we have been using throughout the pandemic. The advantage now is that we have access to vaccines and boosters. And just to clarify, I apparently said that uh, five-year-olds can get boosted. They cannot. Only uh, 16 years and older can get boosted if they're eligible based on what they got their vaccine. But um, to the extent that Oregonians want to help, get boosted if you're eligible. And for parents, please, please, please uh, get your kids uh, five to uh, 16 or five to 18 if they haven't been vaccinated yet. Please get them vaccinated. These are the kinds of action steps that Oregonians can take that will have an immediate impact. 
Thank you, Ted. We'll go next to Tim Court Gordon with KGW. Go ahead, Tim. Hi, good afternoon. Um, for Dr. Graben, I wanted to ask you, um, so, I mean, it was just very recently, a couple of weeks ago, where the forecast looks so much better and then Omicron and now it's so much worse. Can you, can you talk about, you know, how quickly that changes and what that tells you about this variant? And I have a follow up after. Yeah, the, the reality is our, our forecast for Delta is actually pretty stable um, and, and improving. Um, so that, that's been doing kind of a predictable thing at this point, which is which I think shows you that you can model things and, and it can tell you about what's coming. Uh, what's happened with Omicron is that we were seeing um, a lot of growth, obviously, in South Africa, which is a country that had a different immune profile than us. And as we watched that, everyone was trying to figure out what does that mean for what, what does that mean for us? And the pieces have become more and more clear. We started seeing infections in, in European countries with similar immune profiles. And then now we're seeing the hospitalization. So it is a growing, um, I guess you would say, getting more and more clear. Um, and like I said, the, you know, the, the air bond is higher now, but it's going to get more and more narrow over the next week or two um, as, we, as we more closely refine that hospitalization rate. That's the key point here is, you know, how severe is this? Are people really showing up to the hospital? It appears yes. And nobody wanted that. Obviously, um, I was hoping that we weren't going to be talking about this today. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have to be responsible about what we're seeing. And, 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 there, and so that's where we're at. And Tim, because of the time frame, we have a couple of weeks, and certainly it's helpful if our partners in the business community step up as well. Uh, I know that our, uh, particularly our small businesses, have been uh, disproportionately impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, our large businesses as well. It's been really challenging for uh, our community, business community throughout the state. But there is an opportunity now for. Uh, business leaders to step up um, to encourage uh, their employees to get boosted or get vaccinated if they haven't been vaccinated yet, to the extent that employers have the ability to offer um, incentives. Uh, we certainly encourage and support that. And for businesses that can safely and productively uh, have their employees work remotely, we're going to be having those conversations and we encourage uh, the business community to partner with us on this. As Dr. Seidlinger says so eloquently, we are all in this together and each one of our actions can make a difference. And the reason why it was so important that we get this information out now, um, that we be this transparent when literally OHA and my team are still reviewing the numbers is that we have time now for Oregonians to take action and we're asking them to do so. Thank you, Governor, for that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, just one quick question also. I know we, have, you know we have a forecast for infections and for hospitalizations, and this is a grim question, but we know we lost 20, 157 people to Delta. Do we have a forecast for this with Omicron? The, the pandemic has taken a toll on many Oregon families, and my heart goes all to all the families that have been impacted by the losses of loved ones from this horrible disease. Uh, Dr. Graven, I, uh, can you respond to the numbers question, please? Yeah, the, you know, what we are seeing is a, a dramatically lower death rate. So that, that, that part is good. We're seeing that in um, South Africa. We're seeing it in other uh, countries and in the U.S. We're, we're, we are not getting the deaths that we had before. The issue is we are still getting hospitalization. So it is, it is a less severe disease, but people are still going to show up at the hospital and people are, and we're, and we, you know, we do not have that, those sort of bed, uh, that, that number of beds. And so, um, yes, the good news is I'm not expecting a lot of deaths um, from these infections, um, but we, we, people are still requiring hospital services. Uh, Dr. Edwards, could you talk a little bit about the uh, impact of an, of an additional surge on your uh, hospital, your healthcare workers at this time? Thank you, Governor. Um, that's actually a point that I would really like to emphasize is that Dr. Graven is showing us the forecast for Omicron, but it's critically important that we remember we are still in a Delta surge. Although we have passed the peak of the Delta surge, um, our experience with Delta is turning into what we tend to call a long shoulder. <laughs> so we are still seeing a large number of patients with Delta and we have not come down 
from um, our high point in Delta completely in a valley that allows us to approach a new surge from a fresh point. We, we're approaching this next surge, still sitting at the halfway point coming down from Delta. And so it's easy to look at Dr. Graven's forecast and think about that as, um, as the total number, but the truth of the matter is that I suspect that if I asked him to take his current Delta forecast and superimpose the Omicron forecast, that this would look, frankly, um, even more concerning with regard hospitalizations. Um, our hospitals are full right now with the patients we continue to care for, for Delta, coupled with the many conditions of care that we, that we see Oregonians for on a daily basis. And that need, frankly, is increasing as patients and Oregonians have delayed their care for the many conditions of care that they otherwise have, but sometimes for fear of going to see their um, healthcare provider or for fear of going into the emergency room. That's a point I wanna offer assurance about. Um, we know how to keep one another safe and the safety precautions that are in place at your healthcare provider's offices, the emergency rooms and within the hospitals are all excellent and will keep you safe. Please do not defer your care. If you have a condition for which you need to be seen, please address that because we don't want it to get worse and more critical, especially as we face things like this surge. Um, we are low in staffing throughout the state and we're grateful to the support that the state and the OHA has supplied as far as getting us additional staffing to come into the state but those needs are still critically present. And so it's not just about the physical capacity of our beds, it's also about our staffing numbers and um, the burnout. I know that that term has almost become cliche, um, but the burnout that our staff is experiencing in caring for patients. It's extraordinarily difficult to care for these sick patients and honestly see people die on a daily basis. And that's taking a toll on our healthcare workers. So. Anything that Oregonians can do, and we can do a lot to help keep ourselves safe and preserve our hospital capacity and our healthcare workers is critically important at this time. Thank you, Dr. Edwards, and thank you, Tim. We're going to go past 1 p.m. to take a few more questions. We'll go next to Julia Silverman with Portland Monthly. Go ahead, Julia. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I have two very quick questions. My first one is, Governor Brown, I'm wondering if you plan to extend the vaccination mandate for state employees to include boosters. And um, number two, I'm wondering if, given that um, the new variant is clearly going to give us so many more cases, but not all of them are going to be so severe, I'm wondering if any thought is being given to decoupling um, of non-pharmaceutical interventions um, from case rates and moving more toward hospitalizations as a determinant for future decisions on mask mandates. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Julia. Our, our top priority right now is working to get uh, vulnerable Oregonians boosted, our uh, seniors living in assisted living facilities, skilled nursing, uh, congregate care, and uh, adult foster homes. So that's where we're gonna be focused for the next couple of weeks. And then obviously Director Allen laid out our uh, Million Oregonian Boost Challenge by the end of uh, January. So those will be our uh, focuses, uh, priorities for the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I just have to say, everything's on the table at this point in time. Uh, Dr. Seidlinger or Dr. Graven, can you answer her second question, please? This is Dean Seidlinger. I can start and then see if um, Director Allen wants to weigh in as well. Um, as we've talked about with um, looking at the mask mandate, the critical important piece is hospital capacity and the number of people seriously ill um, with COVID-19. Unfortunately, that's a lagging indicator and not usually the first thing that we see. Um, so we want to see um, the number of Oregonians in the hospital with COVID coming down and we want to see the capacity for our hospitals to be able to provide quality care for everyone who shows up without the current strain that they're under. As you heard from Dr. Edwards, our healthcare staff are exhausted. They're tired. They've been at this for two years. And we need to get the numbers down so they can continue that quality care for everyone with COVID 
with influenza after a heart attack or a motor vehicle crash. So we want to look at hospitalizations and see trends over time and those numbers coming down. Um, some early indicators that we would um, be seeing that in the future are some decrease in cases, likely a percent positivity that's low, increases in vaccinations, but those alone are not going to tell the story. This virus can throw us a curveball and a new variant could arrive, such as Omicron, that while it doesn't cause more severe disease, is very transmissible and may elude some of our vaccinations. Um, so, you know, it's hard to make a prediction of where we will be in two months that we know we can stand behind and say, in two months, if we hit this number, we're absolutely gonna say, Let, let's remove our mask. But what I do know is that if everyone comes together, continues to take the precautions we're asking for now, get vaccinated, get boosted, wear your mask, reconsider activities now as we go into what will likely be a large surge, so you can help blunt this and get to a time where we can give you a number that you can take off your mask and get back to a more normal life. Director Allen, do you wanna to add to that? Just very quickly, I think uh, Dr. Sedlinger did a great job of um, outlining kind of the wide array of metrics that we look at as we try to work our way through the pandemic. Um, uh, but I think I think the question kind of gets close to something that's a common misconception out there that we've only ever looked at case numbers uh, and that that's the thing that's driving decisions. That's never really been the case throughout the pandemic. We've had some mix of the factors that Dr. Seidlinger talked about, you know, and, 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 and we sometimes add to or subtract from those, uh, those metrics. Now boosters is, a, is an important thing for us to, to pay attention to. Um, uh, but it's never been the case that all we've really looked at is case numbers and that somehow we need to stop doing that. Thank you, Julia. We'll go next to Liz Birch with COIN. Go ahead, Liz. Hello, and thank you for your time. Uh, my question is for the governor. I wanted to circle back on all options being on the table when it comes to restrictions. Um, I do hear you saying that the focus right now is vaccines and boosters, but I'm wondering what those conversations are like right now if we're looking at the possibility of full shutdowns like we saw a year ago, or if it would be kind of more uh, restrictions on indoor dining. Talk to me about what that would look like. As I said earlier, at this point in time, we're really focused on uh, boosting our vulnerable populations uh, and getting uh, Oregonians uh, boosted over the next four weeks so that we can uh, blunt uh, the curve uh, of this uh, Omicron variant. Uh, in terms of other activities I mentioned, uh, state workers were going to be those that are, aren't already in the office were going to return after the first of the year. We will be delaying that and I'm meeting with the business community to talk about what steps they can take uh, to uh, keep their uh, workers, their employees and their customers and clients safe. And we will have those conversations over the next 48 hours. As you are well aware, we just got this information over the last 24 hours, we're processing it. We need to have conversations with our partners. But Folks should be aware this is going to impact how businesses operate because uh, this variant uh, spreads so easily. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Seidlinger if he'd like to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Thank you, Governor Brown. I think whether we talk about restrictions or recommendations, they're only as good as the changes people make um, to reduce their risk and the risk of those around them. Um, with Omicron here and being as transmissible as it is, we, we can expect significant impacts on people getting sick. And the measures we're taking with boosters, with wearing masks, are gonna keep people out of the hospital, but we're gonna have more people sick. Um, we're gonna see impacts on workforce. Um, we see that in some high profile cases, professional sports and you know Broadway shows in New York, um, but we're gonna see that in everyday businesses. And so that's why continuing those conversations, as Governor Brown said, with our business community and other leaders in the community about steps they can take um, in their organizations and their companies to protect their um, workforce, to protect the customers and clients they serve and continue to be able to provide services um, and goods to Oregonians is where we need to focus. This is gonna be disruptive. Um, this is gonna cause some tragedies, but together, if we all take actions to protect ourselves and the loved ones around us, we're gonna make a difference. We've done it before and we'll do it again. And Liz, I, I, there are a couple things that are different, right? Uh, from when we did uh, the safety protocol and closed businesses down. One is that we had readily available federal uh, resources, financial support for our businesses. 
And the other piece was for the, for the vast majority of that, we didn't have uh, vaccines and boosters and we have those tools now. And Oregonians throughout this entire pandemic have literally done an extraordinary job uh, doing, taking actions, making smart choices, frankly, that protect themselves, their families and their loved ones. I'm really grateful for that. I know that Oregonians, even going into this second pandemic holidays, uh, will continue to uh, make choices to keep their families and their loved ones and vulnerable community members safe. And I really am grateful for that. We have time for uh, just one more question. So we'll go next to Ben Botkin with the Lund Report. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, I, yes, this question is for Dr. Graven. I was hoping you could speak to um, what data points uh, or information you got that caused the projection to basically double in the last 24 hours. Uh, thank you. Dr. Graven, can you take that one? Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, the reality is the way this modeling works is we are both trying to estimate parameters um, that come from the literature or other places, but we also are trying to match up to trends we see. And so the, the, the trends I saw in both um, some new data that came out from Denmark and in our neighbor state of Washington are, are what I updated in the model it was much faster than I had in there previously. And so therefore you can see both a higher, um, it happens sooner and the peak is higher because the hospitalization rate is higher in Denmark than I had thought it was going to be. My initial estimate was lower. Um, you know, these could change again, um, it, but you know, I, I'm, I wanted to make sure that when I came, certainly to the governor's office and to all the public that I had my, my very best data that's been triangulated against as many data points as I can find. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's what we've found out in the last 24 hours. Ben, any follow up? Uh, were uh, CDC parameters uh, part of this at all? Thank you. I, I'm not using inputs from the CDC. So they, they, have, they have a set of modeling results that come through different modelers that will become available. Um, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not privy to that information yet, and I think they will become more public next week. Um, and we'll, we'll look at those, and, and they will be a good source of comparison. We may see differences. Um, theirs may be higher. Um, I would say they're unlikely to be much lower. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I, I, again, we made a choice to uh, provide this information as quickly as we could uh, to Oregonians so that all of us can take action. Uh, to help uh, flatten the curve and blunt the impact of the Omicron variant. Uh, I believe this concludes our time. I, I, I wanna say thank you to all Oregonians for um, doing your part to help us. Thank you to OHSU and the amazing team at OHA for their extraordinary leadership efforts. Um, please stay safe and be well. Have a wonderful holiday season and uh, we'll probably see you after the first of the year.